So hi, and thank you for joining this Genesis 2021 on demand session, diversifying genomics, part of this series of recordings that we are making to cover how the biotechnologies can address the global challenges of preserving our planet on one hand, and keeping also its human inhabitants healthy. The topic of now and today covers the latter and uh, will speak to many of you in the one nucleus ecosystem as it relates to the diversification of genomics data. And I'm really pleased to be joined today by two entrepreneurs in the omics space, Santiago Moyoka and Sumit Jamra, who will share their thoughts on this very, very important topic. So, because introduction is always done best by the ones who know what they're doing, just going to ask you to introduce yourself quickly and, and just to say a few words about your company, uh, and that will set the context of this conversation. So maybe, Santiago, if I start with you. Okay, great. Thanks a lot for the invitation, Aline. Uh, I'm Santiago. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Multiply Health. Um, I'm a, I have a long story with cardiovascular diseases. I'm a cardiologist and I've been working in the, uh, in the clinical practice for many years, but also running a basic uh, science lab uh, where, we, um, where we work with pluripotent stem cells and cardiac differentiation and basically RNA. And that's where um, uh, I got involved in a company that we founded last year together with my, uh, another researcher at my lab and, um, uh, and a third co-founder where basically um, our interest is uh, to, um, to collect uh, samples from patients and measure their RNA in the peripheral blood in order to assess their cardiovascular risk. And we do that by measuring many, many, many markers uh, by RNA sequencing, we can uh, detect more than 20,000 genes in the peripheral blood. And then we uh, analyze and make an interpretation of that uh, such a big data by artificial intelligence. And with that, we have uh, seen very, very interesting results that correlates eventually with the risk of that, that, the, that those patients may have of uh, having a marker than a fire or a stroke in the future. So our goal is to, uh, uh, by performing these liquid biopsies, uh, aiming to detect uh, um, early cardiovascular disease uh, is to really offer uh, a better uh, prediction of the uh, cardiovascular risk that uh, many, many patients uh, have and they are not aware of. Uh, so, so it. Um. Thank you, Elaine, and thank you, Santiago. Um, I am Sumit Jamwar. I am the um, co-founder and chief executive of Global Gene Corp. Um, we, we focus on solving a big problem in genomics, which is that 80% of all data is from people who, have, who are of European ancestry. And what we're doing is we're solving this problem for Asia, uh, solving for the diversity in terms of building the allelic architecture, as well as curating cohorts of specific diseases and understanding both the phenotype, deep, deep, deeply phenotyping them, as well as uh, adding the genomics and the other omics layers onto it uh, so that we can understand the populations and we can understand the disease better. Um, our objective is to work with pharmaceutical companies and biotech to help them find the signals which can lead to therapeutic outcomes. And, um, you know, these are, the, and it's a hugely exciting time to be in this space. And we are truly um, honored to be um, considered one of the pioneers in the space. Um, again, thank you for, for inviting us to talk here, Elaine. Very welcome. And it was good to hear, hear from you. So I, I think you briefly mentioned both, but just the basic of the question, why is it problematic to lack diversity in genomics data and submit to, you put the figure of 80% or your industries? Um, why is that a problem, this lack of diversity of origin? Uh, and, and maybe a few words on the lack of diversity of the type of data, because I think we focused a lot on the genomics aspect, which is great, but you know what's happening to the rest? You want to kick off, Samit? I, absolutely. So look, I think uh, there are two, two, two situations I would like to draw out. And the first is, on one hand, with genomics, we are promising a personalization of everything, right? We are saying we are going to be personalizing our life based on the DNA code that we have. 
and we have an opportunity to do so because the science and the technology is advanced to such a level. But on the other hand, uh, we do not have reference for most of the world. So uh, on one hand, I say, Aline, I'm going to, based on your genetics, I'm going to um, help you find and lead life to your fullest potential. On the other hand, I, I say the same to Sumit, but then I say, Sumit, I do not understand who you are. So I'm just going to use what Santiago looks like to give you some insights. So on one hand, we are offering precision. On the other hand, we, we, are, we do not have a reference to offer that precision. So that's one case why it matters for each one of us. And fundamentally why, if you think about it, you know, two and a half billion people in Asia are left behind uh, because that representation doesn't exist. The second uh, use case, which is very pertinent to the audience here is, is pharmaceutical companies and biotechs. At the end of the day, what we are looking to do, I mean, what, the, what our colleagues are looking to do uh, is very simply find the signals for what causes a disorder. And once they have that, that target, then they're able to find ways to prosecute the targets to find a solution for a disorder. Now, when you look across the data sets which are there, which are across the various, uh, various biobanks and the data sets that are available, there is a sameness of that data. Whereas when you add the diversity that we bring to the table, suddenly we are able to decipher and find the signals which are causing those disorders. When you take a curated cohort, let's say around diabetes, or which impacts 2 billion people, you're able to find those, those curated cohort, you know, the signals, and then take away the noise, which come, if I may call it the noise, which comes in from genetic ancestry. That insight is exceptionally valuable and exceptionally powerful because what it does is it leads to the outcome. And that's why genomics is, is, is so impo important and so much in focus with, with therapeutics companies is because it cuts down the time to develop it increases the success rate and also it cuts down the time to, you know, at the cost of development. And when you combine the three, it's a phenomenal place to be. And that is what diverse data from different population representing cohorts brings um, on, a, on a, a form of therapeutic discovery point of view. So there are two cases. One is therapeutic, very clear. And then we take it more broadly. It's about every individual having the opportunity to leapfrog to the healthcare of the future once we have the reference in place, which can compare them and give them the insights which are valuable for them. It's a true win-win for everyone, Absolutely. the pharmaceutical companies and the individuals. Yeah. That makes sense. Santiago, is, is that something you find in, in your work with your company that you need this large data sets and, and diverse uh, and how important that is to you? I'm sorry, I'm mute. Um, so yes, absolutely agree. I, um, you know, uh, I think that uh, diversity for all kind of data is always uh, necessary, and you can take, you know, historically, you know, clinical trials, uh, you know, are acceptable when they are uh, run worldwide. You know, even even you know, for traditional pharmaceutical companies, you look for, you know, uh, patients from different parts of the world in order to trying to um, equalize the difference, differences that, uh, you know, uh, many patients around the world might have. And, and, you know, the main one that we have seen in the last few years are coming from uh, the genomic data that, uh, that are being collected, you know, uh, around the world. And, and of course, there's a tremendous uh, bias to uh, where, you know, those samples are coming from. For example, here in the UK, you have a huge experience with uh, collecting that data, but unfortunately, uh, there are some uh, bias in the information there. And, and I, I was just talking to another company from Latin America a few days ago, where uh, they are collecting data uh, from uh, Hispanic population. And actually, the, uh, their number is that, uh, uh, their figure is that the Hispanic population is represented around 1% compared to uh, 10%, which is, you know, uh, the weight of Hispanic population in the world. So we are definitely uh, underrepresented in Latin America. So, but there are uh, other layers of information that uh, we need to understand too. Uh, one of them is the epigenomics. So we need to incorporate that data that, uh, uh, you know, uh, actually I was very uh, impressed with those studies a few years ago where um, the, um, uh, environmental pressures when uh, an embryo is developed to make condition your uh, chronic diseases in adulthood. So 
uh, and we don't measure that, and 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 that's uh, such a difficult measurement of uh, you know of uh, um, uh, to take into account you know when we are grown up. So, but we need to to consider it, and eventually the other thing is that uh, how we um, the genetic diversity that we have based on the, our environmental exposures, and and that means. Uh, we live in different regions, we live under different circumstances, our uh, food is different, uh, we have different microbiomes, so that genetic diversity that we, uh, we are beginning now to understand also needs to, to be considered. And uh, we are working with RNA, we're working in a, uh, with peripheral blood, we're working with uh, uh, patients, and of course for us, getting that information also needs to be diverse. And definitely, um, there's. I don't see that we can develop a company without considering diversity at this time. Thank you. It's very relevant to add this layer of uh, of information within the data that as you're collecting. That is very important. Which leads to my question, which will be, what are the challenges to that, I can think of many of them. <laughs> but maybe if you can highlight, you know, this, this challenging we all think of and, and are there ways of, I don't know, trying to address them, um, addressing this diversity of geographical collections and, and background, the diversity or type of data. And I guess, Sumit, that's definitely your daily work. So if you, if you have some insights on that, that would be very useful. Sure, Aline, I think, look, it, you know, we, we have an outstanding example in the UK, which is the UK Biobank, right? Which has set the standards in terms of the consents which are taken because ethics is the first and the foremost and, and the most important thing in as we embark on any such initiative. Uh, the second is the detailed level of phenotypic uh, data collection. So, and that to longitudinal. And the third aspect is then you add the other omics, you know, starting with the genomic side of it, right? Now, when you look at, now let's take it out into an Asian context. Um, so the first important, I mean, there are ethics framework and IRB framework, which, which are consistent and you know, that's what we follow uh, with the informed consent from the participants who are, who are, you know, um, who are giving us the privilege of uh, using that data for research and for finding these insights, right? So the consent there. The second aspect, where it be starts becoming tricky is where do you get the health records from and how standardized are they, right? So in many cases, people, you know, carry, if you come to many of these countries, you know, you'll find that people carry like um, stacks of their health records in paper form every time they go and visit the doctor. And that's something that we had to overcome when we started, you know, uh, we had to build that standardized electronic health record when we intake a participant so that we capture everything in the international ontologies like SNOMED, RxNorm, ICD-10 codes, and you know how we can, you know how we translate the local ontology into the national ontology into the international ontology, and making sure that there's consistency across it, so that when we are looking at that data, we don't have to play, you know, we don't have to clean up that data, right? Is really critical. And then there, there's the third element, which is the logistics around collecting the biosample from which you extract the DNA. And then making sure that you're able to reach every element of, let's say, India, uh, which is a diverse country, and the sample reaches in the right condition within certain temperature control parameters within 24 hours to your lab. Those are the problems that one has to solve when you embark on an ambitious endeavor like this. Now, the reason why we started in India is very interesting, right? India has four and a half thousand different ethnicities, four and a half thousand ethnicities. If you think about the world, world has about 10,000 ethnicities. So if you think about the Indian subcontinent, that is almost 50% of the ethnicity of the world, right? That's the, and yet it, it is less than 2% of genomic data, it comprises almost 20% of the population. Expanded to Asia, uh, ex-China, you're looking at about 60% of the population, yet you know, you're looking at a, a very small amount of genetic data across these vari variations, of, you know, six or 7,000 ethnicities. So yes, it's challenging, but again, we have got great examples like the UK Biobank who have established the parameter and then it's translating that and executing it in a very localized fashion, which is applicable at the highest level of, um, of, of research. Uh, but then it's the execution has to be robust in, in, in the environments that we work in. So again, ethics, 
the most important and the starting point, you know, phenotypic data and deep phenotypic data, personal medical history, et cetera, uh, and lab reports, et cetera. And then you add on to the genomics and then you start seeing some really interesting things, you know, which some of it, we, which we presented recently uh, at, at the Medical Society of Human Genetics meeting in October. Thanks, I think you listed them all. Santiago, do you, do you agree on the three ethics, yes, absolutely. data uh, I, and uh, collection logistics? Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually I always think that uh, if you are um, dealing with precision medicine, one of the main things that you have to be able to do is, uh, it's a very precise clinical uh, trial management uh, because if, if you, deal with bad data uh, whenever you know and, and and you have such powerful information like the genomic data you can't have you know uh, mistakes on that uh, it really can mess up everything and it's very very important to have a very good clinical trials which is a challenge because these clinical trials needs to be run all around the globe and and that's uh, that's very difficult in some countries um, and um, you can't just select a few countries in order to, because it is feasible to perform a clinical trial there. If you want to be, uh, to have a very representative uh, genomic data, you need to include most of, if not all. And, and that's, uh, that's one of the challenges I think that I can see in the future. Now, the other challenge, which is, uh, I think to me, it's also interesting and, and I'm not a statistician, but I, I don't have a precise answer for that. But uh, the question is, what is representative in all these? Because as uh, Sumit was saying, you know, you have many, many, many different ethnias, and, and that's, you know, uh, happens everywhere. So how many patients do you have to include to have a representative sample there? Well, we don't know exactly. Uh, as usual, you know, researchers uh, are eager to get as, ma as many samples as possible because more is better. But anyway, we don't know. And, uh, you know, refinement on that is absolutely necessary because cost can be overwhelming at this stage. Yeah, that's a very good point. You, you would think the more the merrier, but it has a cost. So yes. I respond that this is becoming, you know, critical or not. May I just add on to it? I think, look, it comes back to a point where, you know, um, if you think about a complex disorder, then of course the, the, the amount of data set that is needed is significant in, in order to find the signals and look at what the true signals are. When you're looking at rare disorders, interestingly, even a few handful of cases allow us to get to that insight, which is there. <laughs> and I think that's, that's where, you know, um, this is some, a question we ponder over every day, right? Because this is what my science guys are, my scientific officers are engaged in is, is to say, what is it that critical threshold? What is statistically the right place from a bioinformatics perspective to prove a thesis? And how, what do we need to collect from a case as well as control perspective? Because it's absolutely as Santiago said, you know, if you do not have the right controls and if you do not have the right cases with the right characterization, that data can lead to uh, lead to false output. And if, if I use the, you know, because Santiago is an AI expert, you know, what we're creating is, is the training set, which then builds things yeah. forward going forward. Yeah. Yes, that, that makes sense. I, I guess I was, I was trying to hint into the cost questions because obviously there are costs <laughs> associated and you want to, and, and uh, Sumit, you gave the example last, uh, um, uh, there's the UK being a leader in, in having a national program, 100,000 genome project, etc., which is amazing. But uh, do you think that's the model for that type of uh, data collection, EI? Does that need to be country-led or does the industry has a, has a role to play in that? And maybe Santiago, if you have a view on that, yeah, that's not really. Well, costs are, uh, are high. One of our uh, key points, I think, is that in the near future, this cost is, uh, is going to be, uh, is coming down yearly. And uh, we all know the curves and, and really uh, make us think that, you know, uh, that uh, things are going to be very different over the incoming years. And probably it shouldn't be a dramatic problem. Now, uh, I, uh, on one hand, I think that, you know, 
since costs are coming down, probably uh, companies are going to be able to collect the data. But actually, I do think that the information that is going to be collected is so crucial uh, that governments should have a role on that. I mean, we are collecting information that it's basically about uh, developing science in the future for humanity, for every country, for every population. Uh, and I do think that uh, governments all around the world should be involved in trying to, um, uh, to fund these, uh, these kind of trials. Um, very difficult to organize that, very difficult to organize that in, uh, in, in the third world, you know, um, but anywhere, anywhere um, I think it's going to be necessary, you know, that uh, government, uh, scientific and, uh, and, uh, and eventually companies are involved in getting, um, in, in putting money for these kind of trials, which are going to be expensive at least for a few years. So I get. So yes. I mean, do you have anything to add to that? No, look, I, I think you know these things take are expensive, right? At this point of time, and the good news is that the trend is in the right direction. But when you think of the return that you get from it, it's substantial. So if you are looking at two and a half billion dollars as the average cost of creating a drug, it takes ten to fifteen years. It's you know it's it's looking at uh, you know you have a five percent success rate. Um, and then you're able to turn that around with that investment um, in a, and get a substantially higher return on investment. That's the reason pharmaceutical industries, industries are focused on it. I think the challenge is on the partnership for them to find what can be done uh, and how it can be, you know, how they can have access to it in a way that aligns to the highest standards. Uh, which is what we have found, right? Because our biggest strength is the fact that in some of the, you know, toughest to operate, uh, you know, a, we, we have curated and created the data set. So we find that there is clearly public models, which we have seen, but there's also private models. And then there are public-private partnerships, which will happen. And it's a very exciting space in how this will evolve um, going forward. Yeah, maybe what I'm hearing is the role of government and countries to create the right framework for that. So to enable, you know, this this um, data sharing in a very ethic manner and, and, and creative way. And then maybe the money side of it, it, it should be a bit more industry driven because that's what cut the cost down for genomic sequencing, for example, that, that was just to have more of that. So, uh, and as you said, Summit, it's bringing good return on investment. So, so maybe that, that's the way forward and, and right model. So, yeah. And, and, and Lynn, I would say that most governments have got the framework um, in mind, right? And they have the policies in place to enable such innovation to happen. And, and for this to be expanded. I think the question then is about, you know, what are the business models and business constructs which are around there in terms of moving these things forward? Um, and, uh, you know, the innovation which will happen, which is necessary to, to, to make this happen. And we're seeing, we are seeing a lot of it. So it's, it's, it's quite exciting. Yeah, and it's exciting because it's a collective thinking about business model because it's supposed to be win-win for everyone. Now, thanks very much. That, that was really insightful on, on how we do that and why we do that. Um, before we close round, I just wanted, you know, Genesis is this end of the year conference. And so we like to reflect on what happened, but also to think forward. And so just wanted to ask both of you, what, what do you wish for 2022 for your respective companies and in light of diversifying more genomics? So I don't know, uh, Santiago, do you want to start? What's your big 2022 wish for multiple year AL? Well, um, hopefully, you know, it's not only for multiply, uh, hopefully it's, uh, you know, a year where, you know, all startups in, I think there has been a change, you know, after the pandemia, uh, and hopefully we don't have any, any more troubles with, uh, you know, new, new variants. Uh, because I think that what has happened, uh, what, I, what I have seen is that uh, all these um, uh, startups working on uh, biomedical science, uh, we right now we always knew that we, that they were essential, but right now it's more they are more essential than ever. And and I do think that you know they kind of uh, for example in our case uh, the type of uh, product that we uh, we are developing, which is you know uh, liquid biopsy, something that can be taken anywhere, uh, anywhere, uh, something that uh, could give us uh, a lot of information, a lot of. Uh, 
um, 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 without having to take the patient into a hospital, into a tertiary facility, all that's those uh, kind of uh, uh, new approaches that are coming up based after the pandemic, I think are going to be very essential and for us, you know, getting a, a year where we can collect samples, diverse uh, samples again, uh, it's going to be uh, essential for the development of our company and many others. Thank you, sir. The modern era of medicines in 2022 yes. would be amazing. So it's what's your 2022 wish, main wish, I was about to say wish list, but not main wish. <laughs> Look, the main wish is that, you know, first of all, that everyone stays safe, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I think it's the most important thing because, uh, you know, it brings into stark reality the importance of what all of us in Genesis and, and the ecosystem are involved in, right? Which is about finding cures, finding solutions to big problems that we're facing from a health perspective. So staying safe is my number one priority. And that's the wish for everyone. I think this the second thought I'd just leave you with is the fact that uh, what the pandemic, the silver lining is that the pandemic has basically made it into popular culture in terms of, you know, now every time someone says, I need a swab, everyone knows what that is, right? <laughs> Genomics is part of that popular uh, culture. And so I think the pandemic has actually, right from industry to the layperson, has accelerated everything by at least at least five to 10 years. And I think we have a great opportunity to build on, on there and look at exponential growth. So I wish that success to all our colleagues in across the industry. Thank you. A really good wish. And I'm also wishing to both of you. Um, and thanks very much for this great insight. Obviously, that's a free record, so anyone can watch on the Genesis platform, but I would definitely encourage them to make contact with you directly on the Genesis app. They can message you, organize virtual meetings if they want, to reach out to you on, on LinkedIn or other, or uh, around Cambridge if they are. So thanks very much again. And I hope you have a safe and good end of the year. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks a lot.